Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. The last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. All right, well, good evening. And let's turn on the video so we can see what Professor Pete looks like and get our process started here. All righty, it's a beautiful night here in Morgantown, West Virginia. So how's everybody doing in your neck of the woods? Where we are, it is hot, 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 and everybody is sweating, sweating, and sweating. I can't, uh, truly just can't believe how quickly the weather kind of jumped here. We're always uh, comparing ourselves with what's going on in the, in the Manila, in the Philippines. And today, I was telling my grandson, we're the same temperature as Manila in the Philippines. However, it's in the middle of the night and the middle of the day where we are. All righty. Well, I'm Professor Pete Crackle, the Chief CE's ACPE Administrator, and I'm the most unique breed of community pharmacist. I graduated from Pitt in 1981, very long time ago. I've been practicing for 42 years. I taught at St. Francis University for 16 years. I also sit on the P&T Committee for the state of Pennsylvania and just got appointed to the DUR Committee for the state of Pennsylvania's Health and Human Services. So kind of have my nose in a lot of things. My disclosures are though, I have nothing that conflicts with what we're doing here tonight. This activity was developed by Achieve CE free of any commercial support. I, Pete Kreckel, RPH faculty for this educational event. I have no relevant financial relationship with ineligible companies to disclose. Shamini Patel, RPH MBA and the planner of this educational event, also has no relevant financial relationships with any of the ineligible companies to disclose. Let's take a look at our learning objectives. We're going to recognize how the latest update on CDC and COVID-19 may impact our pharmacy practice. We're going to describe the clinical presentation management and prevention of seasonal or trending diseases. We got a lot of good stuff to share with you tonight. And uh, we're going to review the approved indication, common adverse effects, drugs interaction of new drugs. Got a new drug to share with you. Nothing like it. We do not have an, a Me Too drug when we're talking about this next one. And we're going to identify important drug alerts by the FDA and the implications on patient care. So let's get started with trending news and let's talk about COVID. COVID vaccines are way down. That is not front page news for any of you uh, pharmacists or technicians. Numbers are way down. I'll tell you how low they are. They're not even reporting them except for about once a month. This page that I have here for you, May 9th, it's like, come on, Pete, kick it up a notch. No, that's the latest data that's available from the CDC, May 9th. And I cut out this and uh, put it on a red uh, blog for you. It says, the la last update to this page was made on May 11th, 2023. On June 15th, a new page displaying updated vaccination data will be available. National and state level data will continue to be reported at the CDC COVID data tracker, vaccine confidence and COVID vax view. They're just not reporting the data because there just isn't a whole lot to say. But what is important to say is a panel of independent advisors to the FDA will meet in June. That'd be tomorrow, hopefully in the next 30 days to select which COVID strain new vaccines should target when they roll out later this year. 
So this is going to be exciting is we're going to uh, have the, the big guys at the FDA, CDC, and ASIP determine what's going to be the strains that they need to target. And when they do that, then they can start manufacturing the vaccine. That new vaccine, remember, will not be bought by the federal government. That's going to be commercial only. So you're not going to have to go through all of the stuff that we went through with the initial COVID vaccines. All right, well, let's take a look at this screen. And I'll tell you, I was looking at this before the presentation. Uh, can we get any greener? This data was posted now. Their hospital data is pretty fresh. It was posted uh, a little less than a week ago. Hospital admissions are down another 11%. Uh, COVID-19 hospital admissions per the past 100,000, 2.49. Two and a half people per 100,000 is it. All right. And when we look at this map, green means that they're in the low end. Medium is 10 to 20 and over 20 per 100,000. That's what we're looking at. Only Texas has a few blotches on it, but the rest of the country... It's green and plenty green it is. Tells you that I think uh, COVID is slowing down. Well, let's take a look at some more numbers and, and see what's going on. The latest COVID variant. So maybe this is what they're going to need to take a look at and key in on. Uh, XBB is dropping. So what are we going to do? XBB is half of the COVID cases, right? So do you want to bet on the COVID uh, XBB 0.1.5? Well, that's dropping. What's going to happen when these vaccines come out in, I don't know, September? Is it going to be like BA4 and BA5, which is in currently in our booster vaccine? Don't know. It's a guess. We know that. I'm going to put my money on XBB 0.1.16 because you'll still get that XBB coverage. And that's the one that seems to be growing. Maybe that will peak, say, in August or September. And I'll look real smart. But you know what? I'm not going to sit by the phone waiting for the FDA to see what Pete Kreckle wants to put in the recipe. All righty. So June is Men's Health Month. So let's take a look at June. And why is it Men's Health Month? Well, my guess is probably because it's Father's Day. And uh, Father's Day was started actually in Spokane, Washington. Uh, Sonora Smart Dodd of Spokane, whose father, William Jackson Smart, was a Civil War veteran. Her father raised her and five siblings after their mom died. Mom died uh, birthing child number six. So dad was left to raise these five kids, and I guess he did a spectacular job, at least by his daughter's assessment. She was inspired by a sermon that she heard on Mother's Day, and she probably thought, hey, why don't we do something for dad? So the local religious leaders supported the idea. And after Father's Day was celebrated on June 19, 1910, the month of the birth of Dodd's father. Well, President Calvin Coolidge gave his support to the observance in 1924. Lyndon Johnson recognized it in 1966. Dick Nixon uh, designated the third Sunday in June as Father's Day. And here's our West Virginia connection. A Father's Day service was held on July 5th, 1908 in West Virginia to honor the fathers killed in the Monongah mine disaster, which was two years before Sonora Smart God celebration. So Let's call June what it is, Men's Health Month. So we're going to talk about some stuff that's pretty specific to men. Let's talk about urinary tract infections. And we know women get a lot more urinary tract infections. And we're going to talk about some reasons why. First of all, the urinary tract infections in men is a lot higher uh, if they are uncircumcised. Also, your prostate gland secretes zinc, which is a potent antibacterial that stops the ascent of the infection. Low zinc levels in prostatic secretions of men with bacterial prostatitis. So if they aren't producing as much zinc, uh, it's allowing the germs to grow. The urethra in a male obviously is longer and colonization is decreased due to a drier environment. Urinary tract infection increases between the age of 55 and 65 due to an increase in prostatic hypertrophy. In the elderly males, prostatic hypertrophy, the prostate can grow so much it shuts off the urea and can cause obstruction. Therapy is much more difficult in men because the bacteria seem to get a better start. Treatment needs to last 10 to 14 days. It's just hard to treat those infections of the prostate gland. 
Uncomplicated infections are rare. They're usually complicated because of structural or for functional abnormality, which disrupts normal defense mechanisms. So the men's equipment, the way it's built down there, uh, more predisposes you to urinary tract infections and the bugs are different. I've seen some numbers floating around. I was a little reluctant to, to put numbers on this slide. So I kind of danced around it. I read somewhere that said E. coli is not even a player, but I found some other better references in the uh, AAF. P, the American Association of Family Practitioners, it said about 50% are E. coli. In females, about 80 to 90% of UTIs are E. coli, but men, they're saying about 50, unlike females. But the players, the big ones are Proteus, Klebsiella, and Pseudomonas. They're the ones that are frequently seen as well. Urinary tract infections in the elderly, well, make sure their symptoms and the urine is abnormal, not just a positive culture. Treatment of asymptomatic urinary tract infections in the elderly is not advised. It's said to be a benign disease, especially in the women, because in their bladder, they have these little villi in there that just kind of make a, a nice safe harbor for the bacteria to grow. Asymptomatic bacteria is dependent on age and check for obstruction if recurrent symptoms. Now, here's my question. What is asymptomatic urinary tract infections? Uh, and they say, don't treat them. Well, how would you know somebody has an asymptomatic urinary tract infection unless you were looking for something that you shouldn't be looking for anyhow? It's just one of those things in medicine that just shows it, oh, let's just check their urine. All right, um, asymptomatic bacteria, should not be treated. If the person is not complaining of burning or pain down there, you probably shouldn't be treated. And I know what all of you are thinking, and we're going to get to it. Delirium, although urinary tract infections can cause delirium in older adults, the guidelines recommend that patients with delirium and no urinary uh, systemic symptoms be assessed for other causes of delirium. So if you have delirium, that doesn't mean you check for a urinary tract infection. You check everything else before you do UTI checks. The most common cause of infection in males is bladder outlet obstruction because of prostatic hypertrophy. You want to obtain a culture before treatment because the cause of infection is not as predictable as we said on the previous slide. Women, you're going to get it right 80 to 90% of the time if you're guessing E. coli. However, for us men, because it can be proteus and Klebsiella and E. coli and even Pseudomonas, you have to do a culture. Bacterial prostatitis in a male is that inflammation of the prostate gland and the surrounding tissue as a result of infection. We have pathogenic bacteria that we've talked about must be present in the prostatic secretions and in the urine. Men with urethral strictures can also be at risk. And this is about 10 to 15% of the male population. So it's, it's pretty high. You know, if 20 guys come to your uh, pharmacy, you can pretty much suspect two to five of them could very well have this. Clinical appearance, sudden onset of fever, chills, myalgia, and malaise, local pain, both in the perianal area and the suprapubic area. Digital palpitation of the prostate via the rectum will reveal a tender and swollen and warm, tense, indurated gland. That's when the doctor puts on the gloves, guys, tells you to bend over and checks your prostate, and they can actually feel that indurated gland. Prostatitis, well, it depends on the age. And I always had fun doing this with my students at St. Francis. I'd say, how many of you guys are under 35? And, you know, a whole class would raise their hand and say, you guys, problem's going to be uh, Neisseria gonorrhea or uh, chlamydia trachomatis, a sexually transmitted infections. That's obviously the major cause for uh, men under age 35. So, of course, the drug of choice, ceftriaxone, remember in the old days, used to be ciprofloxacin. Then in 2006, they changed it up to Suprax. Remember Suprax, 400 milligrams, and you take one as a single dose today. We've got to use, because of all of that resistance to gonorrhea, we have to use ceftriaxone plus doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for 10 days. The doxy 100, that's to treat the chlamydia. They always travel together. If they're over age 35 years of age, then it's a good bet that it could be the Enterobacteriaceae or the coliforms. So we're going to then use fluoroquinolones or trimethylphenides 
for 10 to 14 days, pretty much the same drugs that we use in females, but for a lot longer. And for chronic bacterial, uh, for our uh, elderly gentlemen, let's say 55 and over, uh, then we can see enterobacteria, enterococci, proteus, and of course our friend uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which then we're going to be using ciprofloxacin 500 twice a day, or Levaquin 750 once a day, or trimethylsulfa twice a day for one to three months. The uh, one fluoroquinolone we don't use is Avalox or moxifloxacin because we just don't get high enough urine levels to recommend moxifloxacin. All right, it's time for our first assessment question. Which of the following bacteria is most likely to cause bacterial prostatitis in a 74-year-old male? Go ahead and key in your answer now, and I'll give you about 15, 20 seconds to do that. All right, the correct answer. Most likely, you said Pseudomonas ruginosa. You got it. Very good. Mycoplasma, very rare to see that. Uh, Calimatobacterium granulomatis is a sexually transmitted infection. And strep pio, probably not going to see that. That's usually a topical skin infection. So Pseudomonas ruginosa, well done, class. Well done. So it is answer B of those four. That's the one that's most likely. Another condition that men can get oh, once they hit that, oh, I don't know, age 50 mark. Uh, and as we all know, Professor Pete's a little bit over that by the gray hair. Benign prostatic hypertrophy. Everyone gets it. All right. It's the most common benign neoplasm in American men. It is a non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate gland. It's nearly ubiquitous. Uh, every guy is going to get it. 80% of the men who live to be 80 have BPH, benign prostatic hypertrophy. 50% will be symptomatic. 50% of those symptomatic patients will require treatment. So pretty much 25% of the guys over 80, you're going to expect to need to treat them. By age 80, some 20 to 30% of men experience BPH symptoms severe enough to require treatment. Uh, key stats about the prostate. Well, as you know, I have a, a grand, brand new grandbaby. Now, uh, let's say Leo, he's 10 weeks old now. Leo's prostate is the size of a pea, all right? And it's going to stay pea-sized. His brother Luke probably has a who's seven, seven years old. His prostate's probably the size of maybe a larger P of that. And it'll uh, stay pea-sized until puberty. Once puberty and that testosterone kicks in, it reaches adult size by age 25 to 30. And it's going to remain that size until the patient's about 40 years old. At that, that time, then we get a second growth spurt not of you, but of your prostate, gentlemen, begins and continues until the man is 70 or 80. And during this time, a prostate can double or even triple in size. So BPH symptoms, we have the irritative symptoms, dysuria, pain on urination, nocturia, getting up to pee during the night, urgency, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. Uh, frequency, I know I just went a half an hour ago, but I got to go again. And burning, ooh, that's painful. Obstructive is hesitancy or straining or dribbling or a weak stream or incomplete emptying. And I'm always asking uh, gray-haired men that ask me for an allergy recommendation because you never want to give them an anticholinergic. I'll say to them, I got the gray hair and so do you. Uh, can you pee over your shoes? And if they say, oh, no, I have prostate problems, then I'm going to be very judicious in selecting an antihistamine. I'm going to only recommend a second generation antihistamine with minimal anticholinergic effects. I would never recommend a first generation antihistamine to a guy with gray hair as gray as mine, simply because he might not be able to pee over his shoes. Well, let's talk about those medications that can make it worse. Uh, medications to avoid if a patient has BPH. Testosterone is a big one. Obviously, testosterone is going to cause the prostate to grow. That's why Luke's prostate is not going to grow because he's seven years old until he hits puberty. 
Uh, so testosterone is going to cause it to grow. Uh, so the last thing you would give would be exogenous testosterone. Sympathomimetic agents like Sudafed can uh, cause or worsen urinary difficulty in patients with prostate enlargement due to that smooth muscle contraction in the bladder neck is what we're talking about now by a stimulation of the alpha adrenergic receptors. Therapy with sympathomimetic agents should be administered cautiously in these patients with hypertrophy or neoplasm of the prostate because it could kind of shut off the bladder neck and not allow them to pee. Anticholinergics and drugs with significant anticholinergic adverse effects uh, decrease urinary bladder detressor muscle contractility. So it's the whole muscle, not just the bladder neck, but the whole muscle. Okay, so it decreases urinary bladder detrusal muscle tone contractility, resulting in urinary retention. So drugs like antihistamines, those first generation ones are the problems, tricyclic antidepressants, and you're thinking drugs like nortriptyline and amitriptyline, any of those can do that, as well as your phenothiazines, you know, your older site medications like Thorazine, Compazine, things like that. However, drugs like Detrol pose a little risk for urinary retention if they have good flow. Anti-muscarinics work during the storage rather than avoiding. So don't be terribly alarmed if a doctor writes for uh, one of the drugs like uh, tolteridine, one of those M3 receptor um, blockers. They can uh, cause an increase in retention, uh, but it doesn't affect voiding, all right? And diuretics, polyuria second to high dose therapy can present as urinary frequency. You put somebody on a Lasix 80, yeah, they're gonna run to the bathroom a whole lot more and making it look like the BPH is worse when actually you're causing increase in the urine output. All right, drug therapy for BPH. You know, we have doxazosin, prazosin, and terazosin. Which osin is missing? Mini press, right? Or uh, prazosin is should not be given for BPH. Uh, however, Cardura and Hytrin can. So these are the, your alpha non-selective doses and your regular doses. However, we're not going to use mini press at all because it's too short acting because it would take two to three doses a day. So let's not use mini press. We can use Cardura and Hytrin, however, but they're really non-selective. So they lower the blood pressure a lot. Remember these guys first came out as blood pressure drugs. And how many of you see uh, Prazosin use one at bedtime? That's usually used for treatment of PTSD because it decreases uh, sympathetic outflow. All right. So the alpha 1A selective ones, these are your bladder drugs. And this is probably what most of your guys are on for the prostate. Uh, Tamsulosin, alfluzosin, and salodosin. So Flomax, uroxitrol, and Rapoflow. Uh, they're a little bit more selective, more appropriate for the bladder and cause less effect on blood pressure control. So what are the differences in the selective alpha blockers? Well, alfluzosin, uroxitrol is least likely of the alpha blockers to cause ejaculatory problems. So if the men are having sex and, uh, are, and they ejaculate, it can be painful if they are on some of the alpha blockers. Uroxitrol is your best one for that. Tamsulosin or Flomax is the least likely to cause the orthostatic hypotension. Remember, we're dilating blood vessels uh, and when they change positions, they can get lightheaded. Remember, that's why we tell them to take it at bedtime. But it's most likely to cause the ejaculatory problems. And so lotusin is contraindicated in patients with potent uh, CYP3A4 inhibitors. So some of the HIV drugs can do that and can cause a lot of drug-drug uh, interactions. So alfluzosin, best choice for a guy with ejaculatory issues. Tamsulosin, best choice for people that are experiencing dizziness. Side effects of the alpha blockers, hypotension is a big one. These are old blood pressure drugs. And the ALHAT study, you know, we used to use these a lot for hypertension. The ALHAT study uh, was done in the early 2000s. And what they found out with the uh, Cardoras and the mini presses and the hydrants were it really decreased cardiac output and caused more death. Uh, caused an increased death like by 25%. So they quit recommending any of those as first line therapy for hypertension. So 
They were originally hypertensive drugs. So these drugs can all cause hypotension. Painful ejaculation can occur with Flomax or Tamsulosin. Dizziness can cause uh, with, with uh, flow with uh, the other ones, Flomax is the least worse for it. And the big one that you want to really pay attention for pharmacists and technicians is intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. But I know we don't do cataract surgery yet in the drugstores, but it may uh, occur during cataract surgery if a patient is taking these alpha blockers. What happens is the eye surgeon makes his slits and he starts uh, the intraoperative irrigation current, starts putting the water on, and the iris can become floppy. And that becomes a problem because it can potentially prolapse into those incisions. Okay, so the ophthalmologist, they got to figure it out. It's not a big problem. It's a big problem if they don't know. All right. So ophthalmologists can modify their surgical techniques using iris hooks, iris dilation rings, uh, viscoelastic devices. They, they got to stop to work on this problem, but they have to know it ahead of time. Installation, 1% atropine drops four times a day a week preoperatively to dilate the pupil is also very useful in patients that are taking tamsulosin. But ophthalmologists must know before surgery that the patient's on alpha blocker therapy and even frequently stopping the alpha blockers a week or two ahead of time might not be enough. So the, they always have to know ahead of time. While well, shrinking the prostate, let's take a look at that. Rather than uh, just increase the urine flow, let's take a look at shrinking the prostate. If it's a big prostate and that's a problem, what can we do to shrink it? Well, we know that testosterone is the uh, problematic uh, compound that makes it grow. So let's take a look and see what we can do. The indications for these drugs to uh, shrink the prostate, uh, patients with large prostates who are not good surgical candidates, those who just wish to avoid surgery, and as we all know, that TERPS procedure can be really, really painful for our guys. And those who cannot tolerate the side effects of the alpha adrenergic antagonists, those who get dizzy on them, those that have painful ejaculation, those that don't want to take them. So what are we going to talk about these drugs? We're going to talk about dutasteride and finasteride. Those two guys um, are what will shrink the prostate. So they're pregnancy category X. Got to know that. Uh, women who are of childbearing age should not handle the tablets, whether they're crushed or broken. Um, they uh, can cause erectile dysfunction in about 4% of your population. They'll decrease libido, decrease ejaculate volume because they're blocking testosterone synthesis. Uh, we can see breast tenderness and enlargement as well as testicular pain. So the drugs that you've seen them before, uh, they're kept over there in your hazardous drugs section, right? Uh, Dutasteride, 0.5 milligram capsules, one capsule daily. Uh, Finasteride or Proscar, five milligram tablets or dose one tablet daily. And of course, also in that section is Propecia or Finasteride, one milligram, but that's for alopecia, okay? That's for uh, male pattern baldness, not for treatment of the prostate. Well, what are the differences in those five alpha reductase inhibitors? First of all, Avidar seems to work faster, uh, about five months faster. Uh, Avidar also decreases the need for surgery by about 50% compared to the alpha blockers. They just need to stay on it long enough to shrink the prostate gland. Finasteride and dutasteride, they're both cheap now. They're both available generically, lots of manufacturers, and the prices drop by like a rock. Dutasteride is three times more potent of an inhibitor of 5 alpha reductase type 2 and 100 times more potent of an inhibitor of 5 alpha reductase type 1 when compared to finasteride. So it works because it's more potent. And dutasteride decreases the serum dihydrotestosterone by 94% and finasteride around 70%. Both, it's pretty good for finasteride at 70%, but dutasteride, 94%. So it works a whole lot, it's a lot more potent. And that's why it works faster. All right, well, we can't have any discussion for Men's Health Month without talking about the five phosphodiesterase inhibitors for the guys. These drugs were first developed for pulmonary hypertension. And when they were testing them in the guys uh, for pulmonary hypertension, the, 
they saw you know minimal side effects. Everything seemed pretty good. And when they the story goes that when they were recalling the uh, samples back or the the active drugs back, the guy said, "No, we like these drugs. Well, why would you like these drugs for pulmonary hypertension?" And then they found out why they liked them so much. It's a very good treatment for erectile dysfunction, as we all know now. The mechanism of action it works by enhancing the effect of nitric oxide by inhibiting phosphodiesterase type five. Uh, PDE5. So when sexual stimulation causes the local release of nitric oxide, inhibition of 5-phosphodiesterase produces increased levels of cyclic GMP in the corpus cavernosum. This results in smooth muscle relaxation, inflow of blood into the penile tissues, which in turn produces a longer lasting erection. Now, one of the side effects with this are color disturbances because you have PDE6 in your eyes. And uh, it's very important because it affects uh, blue and green discrimination of colors, which can be a real problem for pilots because the runway lights, I believe, are green and the terminal lights are blue. I might have that backwards, but no matter what, you want your pilots to be able to determine green lights from blue lights, right? Uh, headache can be a problem, facial flushing, as well as dyspepsia. Hypotension, you'll see an eight to 10 millimeter decrease in systolic and a five to six millimeter decrease in diastolic. So you can see some uh, lightheadedness. And interestingly enough, the Institute for Safe Medicine Practices in 2016 reported, what? Hearing loss reports a strong association between the phosphodiesterase five drugs and hearing loss. PDE5 caused hearing loss 21 times higher than similar comparators did. So it's interesting too, we can see some uh, adverse effects like that. Uh, then we wanna look at drug interactions and we know this is a big deal. Drug interactions for the five PDE inhibitors, contraindicated with nitrate use, we know that. Our computer screens light up like a Christmas tree. They're also contraindicated with alpha blockers due to increase in hypotension. A lot of your urologists don't get terribly worried about it, but I still would point that out to the patient. Uh, caution with all blood pressure medications because of the chance for hypotension. Uh, and it's metabolized by cytochrome P453A4. So, so cimetidine, good old tagamet, can increase thenophil levels by 56%. It's also increased with uh, ketoconazole and erythromycin. So give lower doses to men who take the potent CYP3A4 uh, inhibitors, such as erythromycin, ketoconazole, intraconazole, ritonavir, or indinavir. So here's the drugs that uh, you're familiar with. I have never dispensed Vanafil or Stendra, but you know we've dispensed lots of uh, Sildenafil, Vardenafil, and Tadalafil. Uh, we're all familiar with the uh, Sildenafil 20 milligrams is called Rovadio. That was the one that was for the pulmonary hypertension. And the uh, Viagra, of course, is for erectile dysfunction, 25, 50, and 100 milligrams. Uh, Vardenafil or Levitra and Cialis uh, also came along thereafter. All of them are available generic. They're all cheap. But the test question for the St. Francis kids is always, which one lasts the longest? And that's Cialis. Remember the Super Bowl commercials with the people uh, holding hands in the bathtubs? Yeah, that's Cialis. They called it the weekender because uh, it would last all 36 hours. So uh, that's uh, worth pointing out is Tadalafil lasts the longest of the three. High altitude pulmonary edema, 5-phosphodiesterase inhibitors, uh, sildenafil and tadalafil prevent hypoxic pulmonary hypertension and the development of HAPE or high altitude pulmonary edema. Optimal doses haven't been established yet, but this might be a really good choice, say, along with dexamethasone and acetazolamide for our guys that are going skiing and might get altitude sickness. So this is uh, interesting that this can be used as a treatment for high altitude pulmonary edema. So let's talk about the consult of the month. You know, we have the bad prescriptions of the month. Uh, this is the consult of the month. This happened twice. These happened with my patients. So the first one, and these both happened at uh, the, the clinic I worked at in uh, Altoona. So the first one came up, he was a friend of the doctors. 
And uh, I looked at his chart and I said, you know, you've been missing a lot of doses on your flow max. I said, do we have prostate issues or not? And he says, well, you, you know, and I had a student pharmacist, her name was Nicole. And I said, do you want Nikki to leave? And he said, no, we need to talk about this. I said, sure, what's going on? He says, well, as you know, uh, and I knew his uh, girlfriend at the time, his partner at the time, and uh, he said, you know, we're, we're still sexually active. I said, okay. He says, and I said, oh, is it painful when you ejaculate? He says, yeah, it hurts like heck. He said, and I have, I you know, we really enjoy sex together. This guy is 72 years old. And I said, oh, okay, that's fine. That's what I need to know. I said, we can make a change to another drug that won't cause that. He says, oh, Let's give it a shot. So I go out to Dr. Gates and say, hey, doc, your uh, buddy's in the room. He's having ejaculatory issues on Tamsulosin. I says, what? let's switch him to Uroxetrol. He says, I never dispensed it, never heard of it before. He said, and I told him, I says, it's all flucicin, same mechanism. He says, what's it going to cost? I said, it's generic. It's cheap. It's going to be less than 10 bucks a month. He said, put them on it. All right. So about three months later, Christmas party, and uh, this guy's there. And uh, we're talking, I said, how you doing? He says, never been better. Gave me a big hug. He says, thanks for making that change for me, Pete. And he gave me the biggest smile. The second patient was also 72 years old. He was scheduled for cataract surgery. And I was looking over his chart, came in for pre-surgery clearance. Pre-surgery clearance for cataract surgery is a joke. It's like, does the guy have a pulse? Okay, so I'm looking at his med list. And uh, I saw he was on aspirin and tamsulosin. And I said, oh, cataract surgery? God, this could be a problem. So I called the, so I said to the guy, he said, uh, did you stop your medicine? He said, well, the doctor told me to stop a couple. I don't know which ones it was. He says, but I said, where are you taking your prostate one? It's the, the green and yellow one. He said, oh yeah, I don't want to miss that. I said, okay, thanks. So I go in, tell the doctor, and then I called his ophthalmologist and they were rather unconcerned. I said, hey, you know, in case we're worried about IFIS, the guy was taking Tamsulose and he continues to be on. She says, have him stop taking it now and uh, have him stop his aspirin as well. She said, and I'll, I'll let the doctor know. I said, oh, are we going to use iris hooks and iris rings? She said, exactly. So as long as they know in advance, they're good. So as a result, I did look on his chart uh, at his next visit. And uh, surgery was a success. They used iris hooks and iris rings and the patient recovered without any problem at all. All right, let's see what's going on at the FDA. Oh, it's time to shift gears and let's talk about the new drug for women. Just approved. This drug's not even 10 days old and we're talking about it here on Achieve CE's News and Views. It was approved by the FDA on May 22nd, 2023. Uh, Nalmapine OPV is an opioid receptor antagonist like naloxone, which blocks the effects of opioids in the brain, which can restore normal breathing. This is going to be a competitor for Narcan or naloxone. Nalmaphene or Opfi delivers 2.7 milligrams of nalmaphene in the nasal cavity. Think of it as just another Narcon analog, okay? The FDA endorsed the Opfi nasal spray update of the drug nalmaphene, which was first approved as an injection in the mid-1990s. It was taken off the market because nobody was using it. Name of the drug was Revex. Okay, and this release was just in time, it was an estimated 109,680 overdose deaths occurred in 2022. Okay, a record, even though, the, as we've seen, the COVID crisis is pretty much over, almost yet 110,000 overdose, another record set between uh, March and March, uh, March 2022 and March 2023. So Opi, uh, it goes in the nose. So why don't we use it as an auto injector? Well, we do it in the nostril because it works faster, which I find that interesting. Uh, it's faster than the intermuscular injection. In addition, the mean maximum concentration after Opi administration was 2.3 fold higher than after IM. Not only is it faster, it's higher. Pretty cool. And the time of onset of reversal of respiratory depression was observed between two and a half to five minutes. And after about 15 to five to 15 minutes, 
he had a full recovery. Uh, will it be worth it? It's going to be interesting to see because we know we have naloxone over the counter. We have a generic naloxone. We have brand name Narcan. We also have Cloxado 8 milligrams, and we also have Zim High injection. Okay, but they're still expecting to make 150 million the first year. Okay, so as we said, we have other injections. We have the original injection to lure lock syringes. We have Zimhi, which is that pre-filled injector, which is five milligrams of naloxone. And they're using, they're recommending a higher dose of it just simply because of the fentanyl crisis. We also have Narcan four milligrams and it's generic for nasal. We have Narcan over the counter. I haven't seen it yet. We'll see when that is available. And Cloxado is eight milligrams. And uh, the reason we have eight milligrams of Cloxado is because again of the fentanyl crisis. Now, just to prove for the women, it's about time we get to the women's health. Uh, Bezo Limited or Bioza approved May 12th, May 12th, not even 20 days ago, we have this new drug for the treatment of hot flashes. Just what women are waiting for, I can tell you my 65 year old wife would have opened this with open arms 10 years ago. The US Food and Drug Administration approved Fizzolinitant uh, Bioza, which is an oral medication for the treatment of moderate to severe vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes caused by menopause. Bezolinitin is the first neurokinin-3 and K3 receptor antagonist approved by the FDA to treat moderate to severe hot flashes from menopause. It works by blocking the activities of the NK3 receptor, which plays a role in the brain's regulation of body temperature. Notice Professor Pete hasn't said the E word yet. This is not an estrogen, non-estrogen, piezolinitin. So how effective is it? Well, results from the phase two trials have demonstrated a rapid and substantial reduction in vasomotor symptoms frequency and severity. The phase three trial of women age 40 to 65 and confirmed as menopausal with minimum average of seven to moderate, seven moderate to severe BMS, vasomotor symptoms. We call them hot flashes, right? Seven hot flashes who are seeking treatment or relief from those symptoms. Most common adverse effect was headaches. Uh, it's effective and safe in reducing the cardinal symptom of menopause by over 50% by baseline. The dose, 45 milligrams once a day, taken every day. Uh, we have to watch for elevated hepatic transaminases, liver injury. So what you want to do initially, let's have some uh, liver panels done before we start the therapy. All right, so the hot flashes, we know what the symptoms are. And this is pretty much for the guys, right? I think we know what they are too, right? Hot flashes are sudden, onset, spontaneous, and episodic sensation of warmth, usually felt in the chest, neck, and face, immediately followed by an outbreak of sweating. The most common reason that women will go to their gynecologist or seek medical care is relief from hot flashes, especially during the perimenopausal area, the area before complete menopause. The onset of hot flashes can be associated with perspiration, heart palpitations, headache, weakness, fatigue, faintness, anxiety, and the big one, sleep disturbances. And those sleep disturbances can then precipitate daytime drowsiness and decrease quality of the life. It wakes the ladies up at night. So let's talk about the physiology of hot flashes. And I love learning this stuff too. The hypothalamus is innervated by kispeptin and neurokinin B dynorphin. They're called KNDY neurons. So think of the hypothalamus as your body's thermostat. It's what regulates your body's temperature, okay? And those KNDY neurons, that's that adjusting the thermostat. These neurons are stimulated by the neuropeptide neurokinin B acting at the neurokinin 3 receptors and are inhibited by estrogen. So when a woman is making estrogen, primarily with her ovaries before menopause, that estrogen is latching on to these neurokinin 3 receptors and by doing that, it blocks them and keeps the temperature under control. Therefore, coming up with a neurokinin-3 antagonist would produce the same temperature modulating effects that we see with estrogen therapy without all of the estrogen side effects. 
and also without those estrogen benefits. We'll talk about that too. Menopause, while declining estrogen levels decrease neurokinin-3 receptor mediation activation, leading to hypertrophy of those KNDY neurons and altered activity in the thermoregulatory center. This thermoregulatory center triggers heat dissipation. So what happens is sends out these little messengers that cause vasodilatation in the skin, causes heat loss, heat loss causes uh, then you're sweating. How do we get rid of our body's temperature on a hot summer day in Morgantown, West Virginia? We sweat, right? We have that vasodilatation that makes us sweat. And that's why women get the vasodilatation. They have the hot flashes, the sweating, and the chills, all regulated by the hypothalamus. So the mean onset of menopause in the United States is about 51.3 years, a little over 50. So many women will experience severe changes in secondary sex characteristics, primarily mood instability and vasomotor symptoms. So uh, changes in your period, uh, the time between periods or flow is going to change as a woman approaches menopause. Hot flashes or hot flushes is that warm, the face, neck, chest, with and without sweating. Night sweats, it can lead to problems sleeping and feeling tired, stressed, or tense. Women will also experience vaginal changes. The vagina may become dry and thin, and sex could become more painful. And the thinning of the bones may lead to loss of height, or bones can even break if they are osteoporotic. Exogenous estrogen can be administered, which affects as many as 200 different receptor sites in a woman's body. I never knew that. 200 different receptor sites. Well, we know about the ones in the hypothalamus, right? We know about the bones. We know about the vagina. We know about the breast tissue. We know about the vulva. We do know about the uterus as well. So when a woman opts for exogenous estrogen, it's going to affect a lot of her body systems. The estrogen replacement rule is this. Use the lowest possible dose for the shortest period of time. So other than natural menopause, significant hot flashes can occur with surgical menopause. Say a woman gets a bilateral salpingoophorectomy where uh, both ovaries are taken out for whatever reason, okay? That's surgical menopause and that happens fast. And then we can also uh, induce uh, a worsening of menopause with selective estrogen receptor modulators, also known as SERMs. Tamoxifen blocks the estrogen receptors in the breast tissue. That can cause it as well. Fluoxetine, Prozac, Paroxetine, Paraxyl decrease the formation of the active metabolite of tamoxifen and decrease tamoxifen's efficacy. So we're never going to dispense fluoxetine and paroxetine to a woman on Nolvidex because Nolvidex is, or tamoxifen is a prodrug. And if we don't activate the prodrug and we block its activation with fluoxetine and paroxetine, she's not going to get the benefit. So no Paxil, no Prozac with tamoxifen. Raloxifene, uh, by giving that for a woman for osteoporosis or breast cancer, uh, raloxifene can also cause hot flashes, as can ospemaphene or osfena, which is for female dyspareunia or painful sex. Aromatase inhibitors, which are also breast cancer treatments, stop the peripheral formation of estrogen, anastrozole, letrozole, and exemestane, uh, just shut down estrogen production entirely. Remember, the ovaries have already stopped making estrogen in a postmenopausal woman. So we can use aromatase inhibitors in the postmenopausal women. However, Nolvidex can be used in premenopausal and postmenopausal. So only tamoxifen for premenopausal breast cancer. However, postmenopausal, you can use tamoxifen or the aromatase inhibitors. And danazole for uh, endometriosis therapy. It's probably been a long time since any of us have dispensed danazole or danacrin. And luprolide or lupron can also be used for endometriosis therapy as well. Estrogen therapy. Well, you know, we said it's uh, systemic hormone therapy. 200 receptor sites this is going to hit. We have the tablets. Remember, estrace and Premarin. We all know where Premarin comes from. Got to tell the student pharmacist that 
Kremlin, pregnant mare's urine. It comes from the urine of pregnant horses. Obviously, it's distilled down. Uh, skin patches like comba patch and estroderm uh, seem to cause a lot less uh, problems systemically. Rings like Bemring, gels like estrogel, and spray like Evamis. These topical dosage forms contain a higher dose of estrogen that's absorbed through the body, and it can be used to manage those symptoms of menopause, such as hot flashes. Doesn't do a lot, though, for osteoporosis, but it's enough estrogen that it helps with the hot flashes. We also have vaginally administered products for women that are having dyspareunia or painful sex or also urinary problems. So we have the low dose vaginal preparations of estrogen, creams, estrace, and Premarin. Premarin cream, just for your information, 1945 is when it first came out. 1945 and why it's over 350 bucks a tube. Certainly they've had to make their money by now. Uh, tablets like Vagifem and rings like Estring are all low-dose vaginal products, and these vaginal dosage forms minimize the amount of estrogen that's absorbed into the body. So what they're used for is to treat the vaginal dryness, uh, vaginal tenderness, and urinary symptoms of menopause. You need to avoid estrogen in these patients, obviously those that think they are pregnant, if they're having problems with vaginal bleeding, if they have certain kinds of cancer, if they have had a stroke or a heart attack. Uh, the HERS trial kind of bore that out. If they have blood clots and if they have liver disease, and I think any woman that's a smoker is not a candidate for estrogen therapy. For some women, the hormone therapy may increase their chance of getting blood clots heart attacks, strokes, breast cancer, and gallbladder disease. And for a woman with a uterus, estrogen increases the chance of getting endometrial cancer. So make sure you're adding a progestin to lower the risk or a product like Duove, which is bazadoxifem. All right, so that's who we need to uh, add, uh, avoid estrogen in that group of patients. So if you can't give them estrogen, what can we give them? Well, as we know, we can give the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors as well as the selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Uh, Venlafloxacin or Apexor is considered to be first line if uh, hormone replacement therapy is contraindicated. So if you don't want to put her on an estrogen, uh, venlafloxacin might be a good choice, especially if she's a smoker. Dexfenlafaxin and paroxetine, citalopram and escitalopram, Lexapro have a moderate benefit for hot flashes. And Bristel, Bristel is actually approved for it. It's paroxetine. Let's call it a, what it is. It was a marketing gimmick, right? 150 bucks a generic still is. And the brand's $234. Remember, however, though, we're not going to give paroxetine or we're not going to give fluoxetine to a woman who is taking tamoxifen. Clonidine also can work. Uh, gabapentin, Neurontin, and uh, pregabalin or Lyrica can be effective, but only for the first few hours of sleep is where you get the most benefit from them. And the oxybutynin or Detrol, that might help primarily with the urinary symptoms. And back to nature, well, you know, we want to do something natural. Well, I still don't think we're going to call horse urine natural enough for me. So uh, let's take a look at black cohosh, which is Simicuga racemosa. It's used for dysmenorrhea and menopausal hot flashes. It's an alternative to hormonal therapy for palpitations, hot flashes, and vaginal dryness. Safety and efficacy past six months not really advised. It's commission E approved. Remember, that's the German standards for herbs. So it is approved. It has been studied over in Germany. They like it, but I wouldn't recommend it for more than six months. Non-pharmacological interventions. Uh, use a fan to keep the air currents moving, kind of like our bedroom. Uh, keep the rooms cooler. Mrs. Kreppel likes the mid-60s Fahrenheit. Uh, open the windows. Use an air conditioner. Uh, decrease stress and anxiety. Mind-body therapy, CBT. Exercise more. Lose weight. Cut out spicy foods, sauces, and uh, especially at summer at supper time. Wear cotton t-shirts. Kind of absorbs the sweat a little bit. And there's evidence that smoking will make hot flashes worse. So try to get them to stop smoking as well. 
All right, here's our assessment question. A 54-year-old woman's taking tamoxifen for breast cancer. Wants something that's going to relieve her hot flashes. We can't give her estrogen. We know that. So which SSRI or SNRI are you going to need to avoid? You need to avoid Effexor, Celexa, Brisdel, or Pristique. Go ahead and key in your answer now. I'll give you about 15, 20 seconds to do that. All right, let's see what your answer is. So the correct answer to our second assessment question is answer C. Yes, most of you got it. You did a good job on that. Uh, paroxetine, you got to avoid paroxetine because it begins with a P. I remember Prozac and paroxetine uh, or Prozac and Paxil. No. All righty. Uh, so the correct answer is Brisdell or paroxetine. Answer C needs to be avoided. Well, now let's uh, do our views part of it. So here's what everybody's talking about. Well, who's everybody? Well, I did a program on Medairs on May 24th, and this was selected as a hot topic to discuss. I said, type in the chat box, what do you want to talk about? And they say drug shortages. So what kind of drug shortages are you seeing? And let's kick open that chat box and uh, get your feedback for me. The community pharmacy, we're struggling with mixed amphetamines. It's coming, it's going. Sometimes we get brand Adderall, sometimes we don't. Methylphenidate has definitely been a struggle for us. The hospitals, I read somewhere, dextrose, levetalol, and cisplatin. And Megan, my uh, pharmacist that works both hospital and retail, says uh, she is struggling at her hospital pharmacy to get cisplatin and carboplatin. So type in the chat box, tell me if you're hospital or community, and tell me what your struggle is. And if you want to go that step further, Tell me, what are you doing about it uh, for like your cisplatin and carboplatin? You know, because that can only be used for, uh, that's like the first line therapy, I think, for quite a few cancers. Believe me, when it comes to oncology, I'm a weakling. I'll be the first to tell you. I had, uh, oncology, farm onc is not in Professor Pete's wheelhouse. Short, shortages on diet, peanut barbital. You gotta be kidding me. Labetalol, okay, you must be a hospital pharmacist. Uh, can't get methylphenidate anymore. Ban, uh, Vyvanse is no problem. Well, I'll bet the folks at Shire are smiling about that. Phenobarbital is hard to get. Labetalol is hard to get. Shortages on diabetes medication such as Ozempic in the state of Texas. Oh, that's interesting. You know, our Ozempic crisis, I guess we could call it, is over uh, at least for now. But, you know, maybe Texas is ahead of us a lot. Uh, glucagon is a a potential issue. Tell me on the glucagon, is that the, the little red box one? Because, you know, boy, uh, I'm a real big fan of using GVOC. Uh, GVOC is a pre-filled glucagon syringe. One's an auto injector and one's just a pre-filled syringe. Also with uh, glucagon, Baximi. Oh, I'm totally, totally, totally digging Baximi. Uh, my son is a type one diabetic and he loves a Baximi because he was telling his friends, you know, I'm a type one diabetic. And, you know, if I would happen to go really low and get sick, guys, I know we give you insulin. He says, no, you don't give a diabetic insulin. That's hypoglycemic. You use Baximi. He said that hit me at that very particular time that, a nasal spray is the best way to teach it. This goes in my nose if I'm going to lows. Perfect. So uh, he, he taught his friends on how to use the uh, Baximi nasal spray. All right. So yeah, the glucagon, GVOC, it's called G-V-O-K-E and uh, Baximi. Uh, I don't know that they're in short supply, but if you're uh, on the bench in a drugstore, might be a, a good option to reach out to the docs. All right, uh, amoxicillin 400. Yeah, we had trouble with amoxicillin, for goodness sakes. How could we not have enough amoxicillin? Yeah, we struggled with that too, Paul. Uh, Wago V, ah, so far so good. We've been buying our Wago V from McKesson. I think one of the strengths they were out of, I think the 7.5 they were out of, but I think we're back online with it. So we're okay with that. 
Uh, hydrocortisone IV. Okay, wow. Community, Ozempic is still short at times. Wegovy, recently, generic Suboxone and Subutex, some shortages on generic Norco. Yeah, hey, Jessica, how about the Acorn Company? Acorn Company was making all the buprenorphine, eight milligrams, and they quit making it. Went out of business. Boom. So one of the biggest providers of it. So we have been scrambling, <coughs> excuse me, to get uh, buprenorphine eight milligrams. Uh, well, let's see, Ozempic shortage because people are using it to lose weight. What can we do to stop this shortage? I think we need to learn how to prescribe better. Uh, Lisa saying Trilicity 3, Paul saying uh, oxycodone is her problem child. Wow, so everybody is having uh, some issues. And you know, uh, this is what I think frustrates all of us is, um, in the world of pharmacy, uh, 